What you been up to, Rashana? Y'all be living your best lives, man. Glamorous evenings out. Man. I need to go this, visit Rashana uh, so I can get some good food. Right. And oh, some, yeah, you know we gonna eat. <clears throat> and some good deals. They got some deals in Chicago, but they definitely be eating. <laughs> yeah. Definitely uh, be eat eating. All right, yeah, we got to get going because I got to um, wrap at like 9.50. So I'm like, what's that, 40 All minutes, right. 40, 45 right. minutes? Dang. This is the Oglesby. Set, and... go. <laughs> this is the Oglesby and Scott Show. My name is Charles Oglesby with Miss Rashana Scott of Flippin' and Heels. Good morning. Hey. Thank you guys all for tuning in. The purpose of this podcast is to share the stories of successful business owners and investors. Um, and today we have a repeat guest, which is cool because the energy that she brought to the first episode was outstanding. So I know you guys took a lot from that. I know people made some great connections. And so we wanted to bring her back because she's been doing some really cool things as of late. Um, her name is Jamisa MacGyver. She started her real estate career at a young age and grew her portfolio to 26 doors. Um, which is super impressive. Um, and she's been helping other people invest and grow their real estate portf- portfolios as well through her her group. So I kind of want to talk about the group that she's been building and the success that she's having coaching and mentoring other people. So welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. So for people who maybe this is their first time hearing you on our show, can you give them a brief um, kind of biography of who you are and where you're from? Okay, so I'm Jamisa. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm a wife, a mom, and a real estate investor. I currently have 26 properties. Um, in total, I think it's like 35, do- uh, 35 doors, though, because like, they're not all a single family. Um, I started investing when I was 19. My grandma deeded a property to me. She passed away. I sold it, reinvested the profits, and became who I am today. Nice, nice. Um, so I know, you know, on the last time we had you on the show, um, we talked about, um, pretty much that entire story, right? That entire process of selling grandma's house and how everybody says, don't sell grandma's house, but Mm -hmm. you know, you sell grandma's house, but Mm -hmm. what you did with the proceeds, you know, people don't tell you, people don't say that part, right? They don't say, or if you do sell grandma's house, you know, reinvest it in such a way, right? Yes. That bothers me. Every time I see those posts, like, y'all did this stop selling grandma's house. I'm like, why? I, I mean, I feel like sell it in a, a post to you losing it, right? But it's all about, like you said, it's, it's the same. Like, it's not what you do. It's how you do it. Because there are alternate options that will have a better outcome. I'm feeling like if I kept it, it wouldn't have been the same. I'm going to be honest. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't pay the taxes. I couldn't live in it. It would have sat there and eventually it would have went to an auction. So it's like, okay. I feel like that is a mixed message, a very mixed message. That was a good point, Rashana. If you're going to say the say, say the whole thing, don't mess up the profit from selling grandma's house. But if you want to make a legacy for grandma, I'm like I did. Please sell it. I'll help you sell. It. I'll buy it just in case you want to buy it back later. So, <laughs> um, I think that is is genius because I mean, I think I think it speaks to how we use money in general. It's like, okay, you can take your paycheck and you can blow it, or you can take your paycheck and invest. You can take your commission check and blow it or take your commission check and invest it. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give for somebody who's in that situation? Because they might not even know what to do next. They just see this house, this asset. Um, what's the strategy going forward? What should they be looking for? Well, if I did know a little better at the time, I wouldn't have sold grandma's house. I would have refinanced, refinanced it. It depends really on the situation. Um, is there equity? Is there any debt on the property? Is the property in livable condition? Can you rent it out just to generate a stream of income? Where do you live? Like there's a lot of moving parts with that because before you make any decision, you have to think about the present and the future. You can't really think about the past, the history, the emotions of it all because that will distract you. But you do have to know, okay, what is the exact situation that I'm in right now? Everybody's housing situation may be different. Like if you're on the brink of homelessness, move in and refi. Seriously. Mm-hmm. If you're somebody who's like, okay, I'm living somewhere else. I can stand and make some more money and I have time to figure it out. I would advise someone to do so. See, I was 19, young, wild, and free. I didn't give myself time to figure it out. I tried some things that didn't work. And I was like, on to the next, on to the next. You know, but if you have time, take that. 
and figure out the strategy that works for you. So one of them would be literally pulling the equity out if there's any, and then using the equity to reinvest opposed to selling the full property because you don't have to. Um, another strategy would be for you, like I said, you could live there or you could just rent it out, you know, make some money, maybe Section 8, maybe Airbnb, maybe transitional housing. It really just depends on what your passion is. Not everybody's meant to be a landlord either. So these are know. things that you gotta, like some people just, you know, not everything is for everybody. People are like, yeah, rent, rent, rent. Yo, those tenants are not easy to deal with all the time. I'm gonna be, I have a lot of them. And I'm like, that 8% for them property managers looking a little good right now to me. <laughs> In the beginning, I said, no, I don't want to deal with it. But right now it's like my tenants, you know, COVID got everybody feeling a little crazy. So I would just tell the person before anything, do what feels best to you. Like you have to be honest with yourself. You can't do what you see on Instagram or you can't do what another person in your family feels like is best for you to do because they don't naturally have to live with the outcome of that. True. Hey, um, are you a realtor, Arthur? No. No, okay. No. You actually sound like, uh, th- I'm so glad that you said that because you sound like me uh, when I'm talking to my clients. And I love, like, you know, certain certain questions, the answer is it depends, right? Like you said, it's not always a one size fits all. And I hope for everybody listening to this, like you in, in investing in real estate and life, like you have options, like your job is to figure out what those options are, right? Like, and whatever it is you're looking to do. So like you said, if, if your situation is X, right? Like, hey, maybe you should move in, right? If your situation is this, maybe you should sell it. If your situation is, is this, maybe you should refinance. Maybe you should, you know, go in with a partner or bring somebody in. And that's the thing is that I want people to, um, you know, really, really get that and understand like you have options and your job is to figure out what those options that's are your, in every yeah. situation. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I think that's the biggest thing, like accountability. Like if we had to sum that whole thing up in one word, it's accountability, accountability because I feel like a lot of people like to take the edge off of being responsible if something goes wrong. So they just want you to tell them exactly what to do because if it don't work yep. for them, it's like what you said. And I'm like, oh, yep. no. oh no. You have to hold yourself accountable. That's what I pride myself on because I've yeah. tried several different things and I did what I felt like I liked, but I had to try and I had to fail. Like I said, mm-hmm. I don't acknowledge it as a failure. I acknowledge it as, okay, you could cross this off the list. I saved myself some trouble. People don't want to do that. They don't have the grit to do that part of it, to figuring it out on their own part. They don't possess it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it's like, or it's like oh, I saw such and such do it do this so that's exactly what I'm gonna do like I said that might not be the best option for them yeah absolutely oh and I feel like we're just in a in a world where we are living based off of false reality that's why on Instagram Mm -hmm. sometimes I got on the wig sometimes I don't sometimes I'm really proper sometimes I'm not sometimes you can see a kid on my lap sometimes you don't because I feel like there's a three-dimensional world that we live in but we are like trying to keep up with an image that's posted for likes Right. And that's just a moment in time. You don't know the second before the click. You don't know the second after the click. But we're looking at this mirror image. Oh, we want to do that. I want to see that. Oh, this rehab looks cool. Bro, you can't capture the full effect of a rehab on an IGTV reel. It's impo- I, I do rehabs, bro. And I'm telling you, some of the parts, I'm like, I can't fit this in the room. We need to get the part where somebody fell through the floor. Like, you can't gauge your life based off of what you see on the Internet. You have to understand. Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, a picture only captures a moment in time. And a video only captures, it's a longer moment, but again, it's still a moment. So I feel like people have to really just kind of build their confidence up and understand, hey, it's not about the gimmicks. I mean, we make investing look really, really sexy. And not for nothing, I love it here, right? But I do know that it's not for everybody. I do know that it's not one of those get rich quick things in the beginning, because that was a fault of mine. So in the beginning, my teaching was, it's simple, go ahead, go ahead. It's simple, go ahead, go ahead. And eventually, maybe six months then, I had to check myself. No, Jamisa, it's simple for you. It's not simple for everybody. So I completely changed the way that I was teaching. I really had to change my words. Like in the beginning, I'm like, well, I'm making it simple for them. So it's not going to be difficult. I don't want to discourage them. I said, but are you creating a false expectation? I, you got to be accountable. I check myself too. Okay, I don't just be out here telling people about themselves. I tell myself about myself often. And I said, well, you really have to change the way that you're teaching so that people can know what to expect. So now what I do 
is I undercommit and over deliver. I won't say it's simple. I'm gonna still give you the guidelines of how you should do it. And if it ends up being just a little bit easier than I made it sound, then we both win either way. But if it ends up being a little difficult for you, I was still honest in the process. Yeah. Um, so I've been seeing that most of what you're doing now is traveling and making connections with a lot of really cool people. Mm -hmm. um, what has that been like? And what's the strategy behind that process? <sighs> that has been exhilarating. Um, for lack of a better word, it has been really, really fun. It's really my destiny catching up to me, I'll be honest. Uh, my humility as well. So a few years back, I would just like support people, whether that be sponsorship, whether that be just donating something, showing up to a food drive. And one day, it was an athlete. He said, hey, where's that Philly girl? I was like, oh, I'm just that Philly girl? <laughs> I have a whole name. I'm a whole person. He don't even follow me on Instagram to know that I'm a whole person, right? He said, where's that Philly girl? Yeah, I like her energy. I want her to come back. So his manager called me and was like, yeah, we want you to come back. I was like, okay, you want me to bring like a sandwich or something? Cause like we were donating and like giving out food and stuff. Like, we'll bring something? No, they just want you to come back. So then I came back the second time and we had a more in-depth conversation about what I actually did. See, Cause when I show up, I hate getting like real salesy. Like, yeah, I'm a girl that has a million properties at age 20. Like it just sounds weird. Like you, you always, cause everybody wants something. So I like to be the person that wants to give something before I ask for something in return. Sometimes that means waiting. You know, sometimes they don't always work, but just in my favor, it did. So I went back the third time. <clears throat> and the third time, it was a bunch of other guests there, and I wasn't expecting to see them all. Um, and it was like, yeah, I like you. So it became a thing where this is, instead of the girl from Philly, hey, this is my little sister, and she does X, Y, Z. So now I'm referral-based. And then, little did I know, a lot of athletes don't know financial literacy. They have a person that they give their money to, and then whatever comes of it, or does not, it's just up in the air at that point. So right. I began to just speak freely about options. Like, hey, well, you know that you could buy a house or if you don't want to be a landlord, you can do Airbnb or you can do, so I was just like kind of giving them different options. And then, so I was in a market to buy a hotel because I'm excessive. Do not ask me why a 27 year old needs a hotel, but that's something that I wanted to do really, really bad. So I um, found an area that needed to be redeveloped. Uh, we set up a meeting with the mayor who happened to follow me on Instagram for years. He said, I tried to get you two years ago and you left me on red. I was like, wow. damn it. I, it. And it wasn't intentional. Trust me, I, you don't leave a mayor on red. But I didn't realize that that's what it was. So he was like, yeah, let's reconnect. I want you to come down um, and have a conversation with me. And he literally laid out all of the properties that the city owned that needed to be. Because here I go, because I do my auction thing. So I'm like, well, can I buy them and then sell them at my auction? It's not kind of how it works. You can't do private auctions. It's owned by the city, but I can give you any property that you want and you fix it up. Wow. So I'm scratching my head now. I'm like, you going to give like here? Like you just give them to me? He's like, yeah, for redevelopment. I'm wow. like, wait, wait, wait. I don't have to buy it? He's like, no, no, no. I'm just going to give them to you and you fix it. So that kind of brought in my horizon, not only for myself, but it also helped me tap into how I could help other people. Some mm -hmm. people just want to return on their investment. Some people just want to see you do the process. Like I said, they don't really want to do it, but they'll invest just to stay close to it, you know, just to shadow and learn. So everything thing just kind of came full circle for me. By just really being a good person, showing up, hard work, dedication. Like Rashana could speak to that. I think that's how I met Rashana in person the first time. She was on a flyer um, and it was Matt. It was Matt. He was having this event. Uh -huh. And I was like, generational wealth, that's me. I am generational wealth. He was like, but the panel slots are full. It's this and that. I said, okay, well, I'm going to still show up. Not like, oh, I'm too good for that. If I'm not a speaker, I'm not coming. I'm sorry, my phone rang. But it wasn't like, oh, if I can't speak, I'm not coming. I said, okay, I'll sponsor. Where's my table? Right? You just really have to show up. And you got to kind of mm -hmm. earn your respect. And that's what I've been doing. And it has been working out really well for me. Now the DMs are rolling. I never saw so many blue checks in my life. They just in my mm -hmm. DM. I'm like, hi. Hi. I'm like, hey, guys. Nice. That was... Well, speaking of that, because um, I, I definitely want to ask you about the hotel. I don't know if Roshana was going to go that route, oh, but um, I noticed that that's something that you were doing even before the pandemic, because you're yeah. going to these conferences, but you weren't just going to the conference. You were like upgrading to the best seat. You're there. You're meeting people like Eric Thomas and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, what's the mindset behind that? Um. I feel like in order to get, it's like a saying that says you have to be interesting. You can't just be interested, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants something. Everybody's great in their own way, influencer or not. I don't care what you do. I don't care how many followers you have. We all have a special gift. 
But where a lot of people go wrong is they expect people to just see that gift within them. Like, it's not one of those things where you're walking past and somebody's like, oh, she has something. It's not one of those things. People are not going to naturally know to gravitate to you. So you got to meet your blessings halfway. So for me, I'm like, what's the ticket to me? So $1,000 for a VIP seat? Okay. But you have to draw attention to yourself. So like a really good example of that was when I met right. Kevin O'Leary, OMG. It's so funny because that used to be my thing back in the day. So anybody who's brand new trying to break out, still my thing because of work. You got to ask a really simple question and you got to throw your elevator pitch in the middle of the question. So I went to the National Achievers Conference in Atlanta. It was um, a Tony Robbins event. So it was him, it was Grant Cardone. That's how I met Grant. It was Kevin O'Leary, Grant Cardone, Tony Robbins, um, Dean Graziosi, mm -hmm. who else? Damon John, just a few big names. So I'm probably the only person that looks like me both skin color and age. Plus I was a girl, Rashada, where were you? We needed to be side by side. <laughs> I'll tell you, the fly and the buttermilk was real and I'm in the front row, so everybody's looking at me. But it's okay, we're enjoying the conference, bang. Here comes VIP lunch, because I make it intentional when I'm purchasing tickets. I have to make sure that somewhere in that event, there has to be like an intimate opportunity. Lunch is still big because it was many of us, but it was still intimate enough to be able to interact, right? Because sometimes with conferences, if there's no Q&A, you miss the interaction and you got to really do the old fashioned network and scanning QR codes all day. But you don't really get your point across. So um, I go to the lunch and I stand up because I have a question. And my question is, hi, Mr. O'Leary. Um, I'm a new millionaire. And my question for you is, how do you overcome adversity? Because I came from poverty and humble beginnings just like you. Naturally, a person wants to know, you're a new millionaire, how? Because either I'm lying or I'm telling the truth, but now I am interested. You get what I'm saying? You have to make yourself interested. You have to draw yourself, and it's going to be I, because now everybody wants to know. They're like, what the hell is she doing? New millionaire. Yeah. So, and my question is how to overcome adversity. First of all, me being at the event was overcoming adversity. <laughs> to call a spade a spade. So, yeah, he asked me, well, you're a new millionaire. How'd you get it? Did someone give it to you? No, but since you asked, I'm a real estate investor from Philadelphia. I sold my grandma's house. I now had, I think at the time I may have only had like 11, somewhere in there. I now have 11 properties. I bought them debt free. That was it. Cause now everybody's clapping. He's excited. Oh, she reinvested. Like I broke it down in a matter of seconds. You ain't got all day either. Cause I'm talking, the whole thing is actually recorded on my Instagram too. You don't have I'm all that. Yeah, I remember seeing it. Yeah. It was a thing. Like it was a whole thing. But after that, everybody's clapping. Congratulations on your new status. When I left lunch, Friends. Now, we, now, now VIP was a real thing. I turned that section into my section. And I also got to talk to Mr. O'Leary offline. He's like, yo, I'm really proud of you. Blah, we got to talk and we got to connect. He's not going to forget that. And if he ever does, I got it on video. But he's not going to forget that. And then after that, I was able to meet Grant Cardone. Same manner because he spoke Mac. Um, and I didn't, it wasn't a Q&A with him. I just had to call out because he was talking, you know, Grant. He was talking his stuff. He was like, yeah, because y'all don't know how to sell a property for it. $3 million and reinvest it without taxes. I was like a 1031 exchange. He looked at me. Yeah, bro, we here with it, right? So <laughs> after that, when we got to take a picture, he was like, yeah, you was on it. You a smart girl. I like that. Now, it didn't go too far with us two, but still I was able to become interesting to him. So that mm -hmm. was always my strategy. Like a person, I don't expect a person to know who I am and it's my job to introduce myself, period. Mm. Yeah. I think the thing also too, and I feel like I say this um, all the time, so Charles is probably tired of hearing it, but 90% um, of success is showing up, right? That's it. Like, that's it. All you got to do is show up. You never know who or what is waiting for you um, when you get there, but also be intentional, right? Show up with intention. And I feel like that has definitely gotten me, you know, into many rooms, on many stages, on many you know, cause is just showing up, but showing up with intention, um, yeah. you know, because it's one thing to go to a networking event and just like you said, do the passing out cards and just the, you know, that type of networking, right? But there's only so many people that you can even talk to or network with in yeah. between breaks, right? In between the sessions. So like you said, how do you stand out? And I like that you shared that, right? Like you ask your question, but you also, you know, show throw your pitch in there um and how what would you say to people who um have a fear of that right because there's also those people that are probably listening to this that are like oh well maybe I don't have anything interesting to say or maybe oh I'm not um good at like standing up in a crowd you know where there's a thousand people at a conference and, and mm -hmm. asking a question 
well, you got to know what you want first. Because if that's something that you want, you can't be afraid of it. Mm-hmm. If you you got to look at greatness like it's inevitable. So do you want it now or do you want it later? Are you going to prolong your destiny? Like you, you're here. And I actually um spoke to a good friend of mine yesterday. She was having this whole thing. Like she was going through something. Her day was sucky, whatever. And she was like, I'm going to get it right tomorrow. I said, wow, so ungrateful. She's like, what? Because mind you, she go through something. But I'm still like right at her. I'm like, God gave you the day. And that's still not enough for you. I shifted mm-hmm. her whole day and then my God gave you right now and then you sit now he owe you something else. He owe you tomorrow, huh? She got mm-hmm. her shit together so fast. She got <laughs> here, so you you gotta think about that. Moments don't keep coming. Opportunities don't come to you. You create opportunities. So if you're scared to stand up and say what you want, you're not gonna have it. Mm-hmm. Just imagine if everything you wanted was just as simple as you requesting it. And it really is just that. Just as simple as you asking for what you want. And maybe you don't feel like you have something interesting to say. But obviously, you're here, you're alive. Everything that we go through is not for us, it's for someone else. So obviously, it's interesting. Somebody else is probably going through it. Now, let's say that you were like the light of shining hope for somebody else. And you was like, oh, no, it's not good enough. I'm not going to do it. It's like, do you believe in yourself or not? Like, I know what I have to say is interesting. Not, and even if it's not, I'm going to make it interesting. But you got to just believe in yourself. Or... Find a more quiet career. Like find something that you feel more comfortable doing. But if that's what you want to do, and the only thing that can change your life in that split second is you speaking up, and you will be a fool to take that away from yourself. Yeah, I am. Um, what I another way that I think that you do that is you kind of you don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. And so you said, ask a simple question because the goal really isn't the answer. You knew the answer. You said, I've already overcame adversity getting here. Your yeah. goal was to speak and be seen and that's what you're able to attain um and so i think people listening to that don't make it too complicated um you mentioned your career you do so much like you have rosebuds you have your community you do real estate investing what would you consider your career to actually be Uh, i don't know i would say a trailblazer is that a cheat answer i feel like i'm cheating but i think if you were to ask me like (laughs) what are what do you do I am a trailblazer. I am a way maker. Now, all of the things fall under the umbrella of teaching, but because I'm still learning and I just share my experience, that's why I say trailblazer. Like, I'm not an actual teacher. I can't be like, hey, I did this and that. I can say, hey, I went to real estate school. I passed fundamentals and practice. I can tell you about this. Hey, I built a seven-figure company while still juggling being a wife and a mom. I can share this. Hey, I'm a landlord. I had to evict somebody. I can share this. So I literally just share based off of my experiences. Um, And naturally in the process, I'm investing things and developing things. So I would just say trailblazer because that's broad enough to cover all of those things. I I feel like it's so simple, maybe because I've been doing it all for so long. It's like, all right, it's not a lot. But when I sit back, I'm like, no, bro, that's a lot. So circling back to the hotel, what happened with that deal? Uh, MG. First of all, it's beautiful. I love it. Um, It was a hotel, I feel like maybe 25 years ago um and then after that they had it as a restaurant so there's a hundred floors on the top I mean it's a hundred um rooms on the top three floors and then the other two because it's only three stories the other two are commercial so they had like a restaurant style something going in the architect is beautiful everything is concrete with still reinforcement I was like ah uh, I was scared of the asbestos but I got the report back so that was good now my objective for a hotel was not to make it a hotel I wanted the building because like for saying, hey, I have a hotel that just sounded really cool, but I'm not going to use it as a hotel. So I'm going to repurpose it. I'm still going to keep a restaurant somewhere in there. I don't know if it's going to be in the same spot. I'll probably put that like down in the basement, but I want to do like a WeWork type of thing with it. Um, the engineer is like drawing the plans for me now. I want to do WeWork and then transitional housing on the top three floors. So make it more of a residential space opposed to just a commercial, hey, hotel, come on, because the hotel is like right amongst some of the greatest hotels you got the Tropicana you got the showboat so it's like I don't feel like competing with y'all about my hotel I had a small hotel so I want to do was was right there um I'm always one of those people that like to move with purpose because I've already mastered the aspect of making money so I'm really big on giving back to the community any way I can they have a really really big homeless problem for whatever the reason it's like people from other states and cities send them there with a one-way ticket like figure it out 
because they have a lot of good treatment programs and all of those things, but they still don't have a place for these people to live. So once I figured that out, I said, okay, well, how can we kill two birds in one stone? Obviously you'll make money from it, but you'll be able to help people too. Because once you learn how to make money, things become less and less about the money. Mm. It's like now I actually attract money. It's to a point where I turn down money often. And once you get to that point in life, that's what I feel like is success. And at that point, you owe it to someone else. You got to pay that forward in some form or fashion. So that's what I'm going to do with the hotel. And that will be like just a domino effect with the other things that are being built there. Um, obviously, some of the other commercial spaces will be fun because there are people who do live there um, permanently. So I want to do a few like water parks and stuff like that. So I got a lot of good ideas with it. I submitted it so far. So good. They're like, yeah, we like that. Bring it in. We like that. Bring it in. Yeah. So it's been working. And is this your um, first project with like the city, like say, like working with the mayor and stuff, or did you take any of those houses? Okay, okay. So you didn't take any of those houses where he was like, I'm gonna give them to you and you just gotta redevelop them. No, I felt like start big and everything Mm. else gonna be easy. Because I mean, it would be, I won't say it would be unfair to me to just like take the houses and fix them up, but I know how to do that already. And I feel like that would be slower progression than doing something that big. I feel like that big, you accomplish you accomplish a task so great that everything else kind of falls in line with it because we, you know, we flipping the hills. We know how to fix a house, it's just a house now. But if you start with something of that magnitude, not only will you be able to make a really great impact opposed to just housing one family at a time because they have a lot of single families there. So it's not about housing one family. Oh, wait another three to six months to fix this one and then this one and then this one. It's like, no, I feel like if you start big, that'll be the umbrella to cover everything else. Um, so that's where I decided to start. I decided to go all in. Go ahead. Because when you survive this, I'd probably be flipping houses in my sleep. Like, yeah. Right. Over. Right. Next. Yeah. Um, what did the numbers look like on that project? Okay. Three million to purchase, eight million to renovate. Completely. And then what will it be worth once it's done? Now let me 15 million. Oh, and that, that was a low number because they said it was worth 15 as is. I feel like that depends on who you ask. Uh, you know, appraisals are set to change. When I walked in, I said, this is definitely not 15 million. Oh, uh, this is definitely not a $15 million property. But judging by the fact that it's right on the water, it could have been. Like, I, I discounted it just because of the work that it, it needed. Like, mm-hmm. the scaffolding, they didn't have steps to get to the upstairs. Like, that's how bad it was. The elevators look like... I don't, I can't even, I would probably have to just post a picture. I was like, this is an elevator? They can fix this? I think you should just make that step too. Like, just, just kill the whole thing. Um, but the numbers on it were, were magnificent. It just was a matter of the city being ready for redevelopment and to bring in new ideas and the type of traffic to accommodate what they needed to be done. Because there's one thing to fix the area. And I really have a lot of respect for the mayor because he said, hey, look, we're not in it just for gentrification. Like he's really serious about the plans that are submitting, being submitted and who's submitting them. He's really intentional about that aspect of it to keep the integrity of the city. And I respect that a whole lot because it would have been a quick fix to just push all of the existing people out. You know how gentrification goes, but he decided against that. So that was another reason why I said, okay, let me meet you halfway too. Cause I don't want your efforts to be in vain. Cause a lot of that stuff have just been sitting for years, like just sitting um, in terms of financing, are you able to get tax credits or any kind of financing from the city? Is this bank financing, private financing? What does that look like? So I'm doing private financing, but you do get tax credits because you're helping to redevelop an area. Um, bank funding, probably. I don't really like the bank funding. So I go in with joint venture deals because obviously all of these big names, they don't, they're not around me just for the hell of it. They believe in me. I've helped them make money on several occasions. So they're like, okay. You're doing this now, wherever she goes, I'm going. So that really works for me. Um, but like I said, I have to keep it in a joint venture manner so you don't have to follow with the SEC. Like it's a lot of what you got to do things the right way contractually. But they do give you tax credits. They did have a few grants. So like for the smaller projects, I believe that those grants would have worked. But because this is such a huge project, that's just like a chip off the block. They're yeah. like, here's 10,000, here's 5,000. I'm like, bro. <laughs> no, it's about a million dollars. I can't like thank you, but hold it. I'll be back for that the next go round. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. It's cool to see your brand grow. Um, you have the concrete real estate group. Is that something new? And how is that going? Um, I feel like I have 300 members. 
they're reoccurring. I've had that for maybe two years now. So far, so good, really, because it's always new people that's coming in. So it went from me doing a class every week to me doing a class every two weeks to me popping in saying hi periodically. <laughs> periodically. But the information is timeless because that is literally a compilation of everything that I've experienced. Like, hey, this is how to be a landlord class. This is how I got certified for Section 8. Hey, this is my lease. I'm actually screen sharing. You know, this is my agreement to sell. This is my assignment contract. I have a wholesale class. So I feel like since the information is timeless, it really just works. So that's something that I just kind of have on autopilot for me. But the people, they love it because you have people who have no clue. And I'm going in and I'm giving them an idea of how they could go about it. Not necessarily saying this is exactly what you should do, but I'm saying, hey, this is how I did it. And this is what worked for me. And then now we just have people lined up and it's like, hey, I'll have my assistant host the call and then they'll come in and drop their expertise. So I have people coming in about business credit. I got people coming in about credit. I got people, whatever their respective field is. And we just like kind of throw it in the pot. And people is like, here, we're dropping a new class. We got the private Facebook community and they do communicate via WhatsApp too. They pretty much stimulate each other at that uh-huh. point. And I pop in like, I, don't be giving false information. Hey, you do credit. Don't be giving out your social if you're not sure. Like I come in to regulate from time to time. But for the most part, it's really just a big accountability group filled with information so that people can now have options. Hey, maybe flipping is a thing for you. Maybe wholesaling is a thing for you. Maybe angel investing is whatever. But now you're going through a host of materials so you can kind of scratch the surface and figure out where you should start. Yeah, that's good. Like that. That's good. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question, Charles, because I actually was going to ask you also about your group um, and how it's run and things like that. And so, um, when people are coming into your group, um, are you doing like the um, kind of vetting process or is it just like that anybody can join type of thing? And then also, um, are you tracking process or is there a way to track process, uh, progress, I mean, you know, of your members that are coming in? So like the way that the uh, back office is set up, we have tests that they take after they're done to see if they actually retain the information. So it's like, what's this? What is the percentage you should not go past? What is a mayo? What's an ARV? Just like real simple nonsense stuff. It's like, if you got it, because if you ain't got this, maybe you shouldn't go to part two. Um, so that's a way that we can track, because they'll show us like, oh, they completed 80% of the curriculum, or they completed 15%. No, she started watching this video Monday. She ain't click on since. She ain't even log in since Tuesday. Like, we can actually see, we can actually see that. Um, and there's no, like, vetting. Like, I've had a few people just kind of sneak in and buy it. But for the most part, it was the people who did the class first. So we have what was called the real estate investment call. Remember, I talked to you guys about that a while back. But the demand for it became so high via word of mouth. We host one once a week because it used to be you book whenever you do the calls whenever. It wasn't like that. So now you can only book for Wednesdays. There's a max of six people allowed within that Zoom class. And then that's like the starter kit for investors. Okay, what's your short term goal? What's your long term goal? What's your cash? What's your credit? And you're getting like a really brief, it's like, it's, I won't say brief because it is like almost two hours long, but you're getting kind of a crash course of how to navigate through the four spells. And the four spells is you have money and credit, or you have credit, no money, or you have money, no credit, or you don't have either. Remember, I said you cannot be anything outside of those four people. So when we figure out what type of person you are within those four, you know, spells, then we can kind of navigate you directly like a gps all right you're the person with no money and no credit maybe wholesaling is the way for you to build your capital you can wholesale this way you can wholesale at auction oh you have credit no money okay use the credit to get you some real money please (laughs) if you're the person with like the money and no no credit no use that money to build you some type of repertoire with these people so you can have extra you know and we kind of just navigate you through that now once you start there it's really not a lot left for you to figure out. You figured out what you wanted. You figured out where you are. Now here are the steps for you to go towards getting those things. And then after that, all the additional classes is for the people who've done some stuff. But you can, they're labeled in their name so you can see this is how to be a landlord. If you're in the landlord part of your life, well, that's the class for you. Oh, this is how you do your first deal. If you're the person who didn't do your first deal, well, then that's the class for you. And then so forth and so on. Um, um, how would you describe the Philadelphia market right now? Because Philly, Philly is a very unique market. Um, a lot of people are out there crushing it. Um, how would you describe it now, though, during the pandemic? Oh, my 
feel like it's not fair. And much like everything else in the world, it is run by nepotism. Like, I know people that are like, you can't get no house for uh, under 100000 Everything's 100000 or more right now. And I have people calling me like, look, I'm going to sell you this house for 26000 Give me a cashier's check tomorrow. So I feel like it's one of those things where you got to get in where you fit in. Um, there's still opportunity for growth. There are obviously new areas being developed. So I came in at 19 at the point where Point Breeze was like the hot spot. I didn't know at the time because, you know, why those numbers were what, what they were. But that's what it was. Well, now they're moving over into Germantown because most of the properties that I own, not all, but like about 89% are within the Philadelphia area. So I have houses that's like the middle of nowhere. Like, this is nice, town. This is Germantown. And now I'm driving past them and I see new development. I'm like, you put in a building right here? Well, go for it. Keep going. Yes. Yes. So now I feel like um, the upgrades and updates are now moving into the markets that I was in. I know that Rashana had the pleasure of touring Philadelphia with Aisha. And you was like, why are these homes so small? And why are these homes so tiny? Those small homes are going for 400000 Rashana, It's wow. insane. No parking. Mm -hmm. You right next door to your neighbor. It's crazy, but... You know, it's working. We have people that's traveling now and commute, and we have the doctors and the lawyers and the people from New York now moving to Philadelphia because mm -hmm. it's more cost effective for them, which obviously, I feel like it does a disservice to the community, but it also does a service. Like, I'm one of those people that I don't tend to take on a victim mentality because we know what's happening. So either we participate in it or we sit back and let it happen, period. So now is the time. If your grandma's house is in the middle of gentrification, don't lose the battle. Pull the equity out, fix it up, get it up to par where everybody else, grandma's older. If she's been there for 20 years or more, and she's able to get on a program and sign a waiver, whereas though her taxes cannot be raised, because that's the big thing with gentrification. Like they're pushing everybody out because the taxes are not affordable. You have to just know your rights um, in those regards. And in terms of the cheap numbers, they still have them. Um, they did postpone our auctions for a full year. So the last live auction was February, 2020. And then they just recently had one April, was like April 26th or 25th or something like that. But they had converted it into virtual, which was horrible. So yeah, I know my biggest thing was the $600 houses. You put the 10% down. They was like, no, mm -hmm. for this specific auction, you need $10,000. I said, see y'all, I've been telling y'all this for about five years. But y'all gonna let them down, price y'all out. I was like, ugh. But however, whatever. I don't think that that auction worked out too good because they just did another breaking news announcement and they postponed it again till September. I feel like they got so many kinks to work out. They they not liking it. So I actually set up a meeting with the sheriff so I could sit down and talk to her like sis. I know this your city. I don't mean no disrespect. However, first of all, I'm y'all greatest marketer. I gotta let her know that. And I got the analytics to prove how many people I just took to her sheriff cell personally, but how many people have actually booked according to the information that I was providing about her auction. So I can help her. I can stand to help her and her city. I'm going to tell her what's in it for her. I'm going to tell her how I can be of service. And hopefully, you know, I can change the whole dynamics of how the share cell works in its entirety. Um, but for right now, people who are listening, if you want to get in the market, still hit that auction. It's not live and active now, which means there's nothing but opportunity because you have millions of people who are waiting to lose the house. And there's nothing worse than waiting to lose something. Right? So the anxiety is there. You slide up and you present a an, an solution or an opportunity for them to make out better than they would if they lost the house. So you can still mm. get houses. It's, it's mm -hmm. tons of them. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I like that. There's a lot of people doing, uh, I, real estate coach Carter's in, in Philly. Of course, ah! Saisha, of course, Doug D. Yeah. Philly is where it's at, man. Um, have you considered investing outside of Philadelphia? Often. A lot. Um, I actually have a property in Atlanta. I have some properties in Chester, but that don't really count because that's right on the outskirts of Philadelphia, Florida. So I do think about doing it like on a larger scale in the near future, but I don't like spreading myself thin because I'm one of those people, like if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So I need to be like, what's happening? What's going on over here? Detroit is a place that I want to go to. I visited several times. They had a 13 unit for $2,500, right? I don't know where it's at. Somebody probably took it. At first, originally it was five. And I think it went from 10 to five and then 25. And I started scratching my head, like, what's wrong? And it was because it had to be fixed up within a certain time frame. Like the way that they deliver properties in Detroit is different than Philly. So Philly, I'm like, oh, I can afford it. Let me grab it and I can sit on it until I get around to it, which gives me opportunity to fix them up one at a time. 
in certain areas, it wasn't like that. So Detroit is a place that I'm really, really interested in. But that's something that I would have to dedicate a lot of my time to. And because I'm already doing a lot of things, it's like, okay. But I'll definitely make my way around the map one spot at a time. They sleep on it's Detroit. Like, yeah, it's like pissing on a fire hydrant. That's how I look at real estate. I go, if I get one thing and lock it in, it's like, all right, we got a little bit of territory. I'll be back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So while you're working on um, the big deal, uh, you're still taking on um, new acquisitions. It's just like if a good deal comes, like are you actively, you know, still investing in single families or, you know, and, and what does that look like too? Like you're investing because I know, uh, like you say, you uh, traditionally hold properties. Do you ever do any flips? Like I know we are in a seller's market. So, yeah. you know, what, what, is, what is all that looking for you? Um, it's, like right it's now. looking real traumatic. Was very, this is trauma for me. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. When I sold my grandma's house, that was a gut punch, especially when I figured out everything I did wrong. Now I house hoard by accident. I'm not actively looking for deals. I'm not deal hunting because I have a really good rent roll coming. I'm, I'm comfortable. So I'm like, all right, now you can focus on some other stuff. However, a lot of the work I do, like you'll see, I don't really market a lot. I post cool pictures so people can just know I'm still alive and kicking, but I don't really do too much marketing because my word of mouth is great. It's like amazing. So I have people and if they bring me deals and the numbers make sense, then I'll purchase them. I have flipped a few properties just because of the monopoly game. I started running out of money and it's like, okay, no, you got to free up some liquid. But then I started to use insurance as a means of using money to my, my great advantage. So I don't even have to do that anymore. Now I don't have to sell. So I don't. So when it comes to me, it's like, okay, what's the condition? How bad is it? Can I stand to make some money from it right away? Okay, is it a turnkey? You know, I'm considering those things because I don't want to really buy too many properties that are complete rehabs unless the numbers are like irrefusable. If you bring me something, it's 10,000. I don't even, I don't want to see it. Send the paperwork, we gonna sign it. I'll close on it. If it's something that's really low, then I'll do it. If it's something that's higher, like 100,000, 120, 150, then I really have to analyze the deal, such as how much work it needs, you know, how soon I can get it up and running, all of those things. But I do still buy. If you have a deal, please call me. <laughs> I'll definitely get it done one way or another. So I hear a lot of people talking about insurance as a means of just wealth. Um, can you explain to us how you're leveraging insurance to invest still? That's insane. Um, so you have to have a certain type of policy. It has to be a whole life. It's not universal. It has to be a whole life policy, uh, preferably dividend paying so that you can make money on the front end and the back end. Um, so if you look at it, it's a whole thing. One of my really, really close friends has a full program talking about using insurance as a banking system. So much so he just got an honorary PhD for it two days ago. And they're making his curriculum a part of the college requirements. Like it's a requisite to graduate. Like that's how solid it is. But for me, um, I get a premium. There's, there's several of them. So you can choose what you want. You don't always have to start high. I'll say like 150. So 150 is my annual premium. With 150, I have a death benefit of 7 million. I'm just saying, I got to think about a specific one because I know I have one for 120, one for 150, it's a few. But just to give you an idea, you're able to borrow against your own policy, ultimately becoming your own bank. Mm -hmm. Now you can't rob yourself because it's yourself, right? But you're looking at no interest. So you're not actually paying interest on your money because it's yours. And if you don't pay it back, it comes from the death benefit. And it's weird because, okay, with my 150, I have to pay that annually, but it's like, what's 150 a year? That's nothing. So you do pay that annually. You get to borrow 80% of your money right away. It's like 75 to 80%. So I know with my 150, I was able to get 97 right away, like of my own money, right? Now my 150 is still, even though I borrowed the 97 from myself, my 150 is still in the policy accruing interest because I took that from the death benefit, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So your 150 is unscathed. It's still sitting there, still collecting interest. Now, people will naturally say, well, then that means you just got a year to pay back the 97. No, next year when I put the 150 in again to keep my policy up and running, they don't take the 97 from the 150 because they're not able to use new money to pay for old money. So naturally that 97 just came off of my 7 million death benefit. So when I die and the profits from my insurance policy is paid out, my kids will get $7 million minus the nice. 97 that I took to go do. Exactly. So well, it makes sense. Would've, you would have probably blown that 95 or 97 up through investing. Listen, I have four children. They got like three policies a piece. 
I will come back from the dead to slap the one that says, where's my 97,000? Like, bro, you got 7 million. Like, God, send me that. I got I just got to <laughs> say something. God, just I need one more second with this kid. But no. Yeah, it's like really, a, like I said, a chip off the block. And you can get as many policies as you would like as long as you, you know, can show, hey, I'm not money laundering. I actually make money legally from this place. I'm healthy. You know, they do come out and do an exam. They draw blood and then they take a urine sample. And they only do that for people who are in, like doing it on a higher scale, like higher numbers. But if you're doing it at a lower number, then I don't even think they need the pyramid exam done. Mm. Yeah, but it works. And when you start to read the history of insurance, um, most wealthy people got wealthy using insurance. So you think about the Rothschilds, you think about Wal Walmart, uh, that's the Waltons. They actually became wealthy using insurance. Like they had Walmart, but then they started getting insurance policies on their workers. They got sued for it, you know, after a while, but still, that is how they really got their big, um, their big wealth ticket. And then for Warren Buffett, I think, and you could quote me, I feel like he said his net worth tripled when he started using insurance. So much so he actually started to purchase insurance companies. He was like, the hell with this. Mm. There's it, more money to be made. Hold on, wait a minute, right? And if you think about it, insurance and real estate are the two guaranteed ways to wealth. And those are the two things that are everlasting because everybody has insurance. You think about car insurance. We get car insurance the moment we pull off the lot. We pay every single month. If you never get into an accident, okay. You just pay every single month. Where do you think that extra money goes? And then like the FDIC obviously is backed by insurance, but it's life insurance, literally. All of the people that pay into insurance policies and don't quite know how to use it, like they get term or they do whatever they feel like works for them. If you look at the FDIC's ledger, which is public record to its investors, we are its investors because we get insurance. People don't go on the FDIC because they like, what the hell I'm going over there for? But if you go and you start to search different banks, any bank of your choice, Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Waco, whoever you use, They'll show you what they have in reserves. Every single bank has a specific number for real estate and a specific number for insurance. Their number for insurance is always higher than their number for real estate, which makes you think, why the hell would a bank invest in more in insurance than real estate, right? Mm. Start scratching your head, you do some research, and it makes sense. But it is way deeper than that. Um, just even going back to the slave days, slave owners got insurance on their slaves when they were either beaten, injured, or killed. So that kind of explains why they was hurting us the way that they were hurting us too, outside of the fact that they were like evil. But insurance became a thing. Now, when they made, um, when they signed the, I think it was the Emancipation Proclamation. What was that? I think that's what it was. It was it the Declaration of Independence. One of those, when they freed the slaves, um, they end up changing the dynamics of how life insurance works. So they made a new insurance for newly freed people and working class citizens. Obviously, newly free slaves will go get jobs, right? So they made that available to them. And it's just crazy how we still somehow stuck in a slave mentality because some of my relatives, some black people still use insurance in the same way that it was designed for them to use it back in the slave days. Because my great grandma, she's still alive, I retire her. She gets insurance on every single person. Like my first paid off policy, I didn't even know. Like it was paid off because my grandma said get insurance, but I didn't know what it was and how to use it. It was about $10,000. I got it when I went to college and then paid it, paid it, whatever. But she didn't even know that you are supposed to borrow against it. There's a life benefit as well as a death benefit, all of those things. Mm. So I think about the people who don't know that. Like there's so many fish fries. I don't know if they do that where y'all from, but where we're from, if you die and you don't have insurance, the people who love you gather and do a fish fry to like raise money it's like a fundraiser it's a philly thing but <laughs> i think about it like this well you may have like been murdered due to gun violence some type of drug dealing or whatever if you had insurance you wouldn't even have to be in the game or you wouldn't even have to be selling drugs so the very thing that you are now raising money for after your death could have been the very thing that you used to save your life yeah. like literally so once i learned that i was like oh okay cool so now i don't make any big purchases or any big anything without like okay let's say you want to sell me a house and i'm gonna buy it in cash and i got the 150,000 in cash right now i will put that in the policy and then take it out the policy to buy the house because i'm borrowing oh. it from myself now you get what i'm saying i was like i'm not even moving out in my own bank like there's no other way to live at this point and then you can obviously use that because it's backed by the fdic you can use that for angel investment there's a lot of different 
tips and tricks. I ain't telling nobody yeah. what to do with their money, but it is definitely a way of life for me at this point. So if you guys are listening to this, your homework is to study the insurance industry and study how you can leverage insurance. I'm definitely going to be doing that because I don't want to spend my own money. I'd rather spend uh, the bank's money or the insurance company's money. Yeah. We, we do have to wrap. Um, this is a great conversation. And the insurance conversation is, I think, next level. We aren't talking about that yet. Um, yeah, it's great. It's a book. It's called The Banking Blueprint. Um, yeah. It's by Jake Taylor Jacobs. Phenomenal. But listen listen i can't I, I, it's not even enough enough upselling in the world that i could potentially do <laughs> please read it the author he's african-american he just bought his rolls royce for free using his banking system okay he's a part of the Forbes business council he's verified on instagram i know people love a good blue check he's verified <laughs> um yeah and like i said he actually just received the honorary phd so for those who don't know what that means he bypassed every single class it takes to be a doctor. The college was like, and it was unanimous too. The college was like, no him. And they actually made that banking blueprint book a part of their college curriculum. I think that's a big deal, especially for an African-American male who's under 30. I think yeah. that's like superb. So you so, read that book. It's great. Definitely gonna check that out. I need to learn how to leverage. Um, great interview. Just- one last question before we go. Where can people find you? Where can they follow you? And where can they support what you have going on? I'm on tour. I'll probably be in a city near them. Oh, oh, she, right. <laughs> she was literally, she was literally down the street from me. She was, and I saw I was like she's checked in at Ranch Hookamonga. I was like, that's crazy. I it's had no like idea. Exits. I literally had not, that was uh Ice Cube. I had to meet with Ice right. Cube. Um, but I'm Rosebud's investments everywhere, guys. So Rosebud's investments via IG. Rosebud Investments via Facebook, um, Jamisa Bennett on LinkedIn. I know you see MacGyver everywhere that's made in. I'm actually married. So Jamisa Bennett was where you would find me on LinkedIn. But yeah, the website is the same, www.rosebudsinvestments.com. And we're here nice. to serve you. So Rashana had to leave. I guess she has an appointment. I but know. Super, super fire interview. I appreciate you. Um, this episode should be up in about a week or so. Thank you guys all for tuning in. Um, make sure you leave us a rating review. We like five-star reviews. And yeah, this has been another episode of the Oglesby and Scott Show. My name is Charles Oglesby with Rashana Scott, who checked out early, signing off. Bye Thank guys. you very much. So I'll, I'll shoot you the links when it's ready. Okay. And the next time I'm in LA, I'll, I'll dim you. Yeah. I told you this to be a number because I had no idea. Like I know that you were in LA I just didn't know where and that's yeah. crazy when I'm in LA I bump into all of these random like I was at a gas station and Offset pulled up in like a purple AMG really and I was like that's awesome <laughs> what the hell I didn't even look I didn't even say anything I was just so stuck like this is crazy and then throughout my stay it just was more and more people I'm like yo LA is really a place people come like this is insane to me Everybody lives in LA. Everybody. Yeah. It's just crazy. Floating around. I was like, mm, all yeah. right. So yeah, I do like it. It's a really cool place. <laughs> um, I, I feel like every one day in LA though is like two days long. The time difference for me would be a lot. It's like, it's only three o'clock. Why do I feel like it's bedtime already? Yeah. <laughs> like what's wrong? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. And then the food. Y'all gotta work on with your feeding people, but outside of that, yeah. Um, LA owes me nothing. I'm every time I go, I leave with everything I came with and then some. <laughs> That's good to know because it's expensive out there. Very. Yeah. Well, look, um, one of one of my I would say associates, he is a former basketball player. His name is Terrence. Um, he just got in Santa Monica, he just got two properties on the waterfront. Like literally, if you look out the backyard, it's beachfront right there. He got them for free. From his non for his nonprofit, five. Wow. One of them was five point two million, and that's what that one was worth. And the other one is worth uh, I forgot, but I know that they're like not too far away. For free, they wow. gave it to him. Um, his his Instagram is we see greatness in you. So he's mm-hmm. like a, a advocate for just pulling out a greater purpose in people. Um, but whatever. Long story short, I think I'm going over there with my nonprofit to give me some waterfront <laughs> property. Right. And I'll make something free. of it. Who knows? Yeah, they gave them two for free. And they're beautiful properties. They're not like yeah. 
shit, obviously on the waterfront, but they're not shabby. I was like, what? He's like, they gave me two. You got to get here now. I was like, I'll be back wow. next week. I'm coming. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know about that. I know that it existed. So that's crazy. That's a thing. That is a definite thing. So I'll keep you posted with um the upcoming work that I'll be doing in LA because I'm telling you, I ain't turning down a waterfront property. Even if they <laughs> said you have to move here. I'm like, okay, kids, we're going over there. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot of great opportunities. Um, Even in the most expensive areas, it's not what you do, it's really just how you do it and finding an angle to attack. And um, yeah, I'm really good on finding those types of things. Well, I'm gonna be honest, they're actually finding me now, just doing my faith walk and just trusting God. He did say obedience is greater than sacrifice. And that was one of the things I wanted to share. Just do what you feel is right, even when you don't understand it. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. All righty. Well, thank you again for having me. I know it's church day. So it is. It was definitely a pleasure. All right. I'll talk to you later. All right.